Okay, so this lecture follows on the last to talk a little bit more about Coulomb failure stress and um, also shows kind of a little bit more about that software called Coulomb that I demoed last, like two weeks ago. So, um, so and there's kind of some famous applications of this, which I've just showed with respect to uh, kind of recent example from induced seismicity, but this famous paper by Jeff King and others showed how you could use this in a more like tectonic kind of earthquakes setting. And so key concepts we want to make sure you guys are aware of is idea of source faults versus receiver faults. Um, what are optimally oriented faults? We assume that receiver faults are close to failure, so um, and that the tree and then one of the problems, and this is kind of what Jisoo picked up on in the last lecture is the triggering time. So when we talk about, especially like the lec this first word is static, which means that we time dependence is not a key part of this. It's more like we just um, kind of assume sort of sequential change and it doesn't really have like the dynamic transfer of stress by like the propagation of seismic waves. It's sort of either just instant, like time is not a part of it, except for this happens and then that happens. And you'll see where that is good and where it's not as we go through. So just to remind you guys, when we, when we talk through this a little bit, but this, when we talk about optimal orientation of faults, um, it's, you know, it's the first one to fail, which is that perfect combination of shear and normal, which is right at that location where you have the tangent of the, which is be that failure line relative to the Mohr circle at that instant. And so that's the one orientation and the, therefore the one set of, of, you know, traction components that will fail. And so that's when we talk about optimal, it's kind of like the perfect orientation. But a lot, one thing we also assume in the Earth's crust is there's lots of little faults kind of around, like it, the Earth's crust is not perfect. There's always pre-existing fractures, and so it's not that difficult to find a fracture that's in the correct orientation for that stress state. And so it's not a bad assumption that you would assume optimal orientation. But you could choose other orientations. You just have to crank up the stress more. So um, we'll talk more about this in the next lecture. So I won't, um, which I'll, I will record for you guys. But this is like in one page is the full uh, 3D derivation to go from basically the top, which is like principal stresses with some orientation in 3D, to the traction components on a specific plane that has an orientation defined by the normal, by the normal, which is the n, and um, we use basically dot and cross products to figure this out. And at the very bottom, out comes our Coulomb failure function or the Coulomb failure stress. So I'll walk us through this in the next lecture, but. For today, just know that this kind of what's going on is is we're we're basically taking the three D stress state, which is the tensor, and we're resolving onto a plane the the normal and shear traction or the traction components. So then you know here's just some kind of pretty pictures that sort of illustrate how we calculate Coulomb stress, which is basically looking at these traction components in space. So the first thing is we have like on the upper left is there's some fault that's like a source fault so it slips and that's the white white thing. And then what's shown in blue and red is this Coulomb well right here is just a shear traction change on faults that would be parallel to that source fault. So the receiver faults are all parallel. Doesn't matter how long they are, it's just basically anything with that orientation. So what you can see is that, you know, on either side of the the source fault, the receiver faults have a decrease in shear traction. Because basically that fault kind of sucks it up as it's slipping. But then out in front of the fault, 
the shear traction goes up. And this is kind of a symmetric effect. But we know also that the faults depend on the normal traction, so how, you know, how much they're, they're sort of clamped together. So this is a more of an anti-symmetric effect. And so what you can think of is, um, you know, here, again, the same source fault, and then we're calculating the change in normal traction scaled by the friction uh, on all possible parallel receiver planes. And so this is like in that little inset in the upper left there is like it's being pulled apart so or you know being pushed together. So the degree of clamping. And so then graphically what we do to calculate the Coulomb failure stress is add those two together. And so this is kind of this anti-symmetric uh, pattern. So it's a little bit complicated. But what we can see is that you know in the zone near the fault, no matter how you kind of calculate it, the overall Coulomb failure stress drops. And so that means it's, un it's less likely that faults right near the m source fault that have the same orientation will fail. But what is m looks like most likely is out in front of the receiver fault are source faults that, or sorry, out in front of the source fault, which is the white one, would be receiver faults that have increased Coulomb stress. So they're likely to c slip. And that's kind of useful to know. How would this work with like, uh, is it N-echelon fracturing where it comes off the fault? Yeah, well, N-echelon um, N -echelon would be, uh, it's really just when you have faults where you're, you kind of go along one and you step either to the left or to the right to find another. but the, the faults are, are sub-parallel, but not co-linear or co-planar. So you have to step a little bit to find the other ones. So this, this um, in that sense, is kind of thinking about an echelon faulting, where we're looking at if one of the faults slips, what's the effect on the neighbors, on, the, on its other ones in that set? But what this shows is that you kind of need to be in the same plane as the source fault to have the most stress transferred to you. So if you get too far to the left or the right, you end up in the blue. And so you're not, you're basically less likely to slip based on the induced stresses. So we'll see some examples of how this has been used. But the main thing is, and I had a student quite some time ago and she was like, yeah, it's kind of like you have the flamethrower out in front of the fault. So the flamethrower is sending its flames out and so that's other faults that are likely to catch on fire, which would mean that they would slip. So that's how she tried to remember it. So, you know, we're, when we talk about this optimal orientation or, or, or like in this case we're talking about a specified orientation, but we can also talk about in that volume which are the most fault-oriented faults. And so you can, there's you know, a couple, in this nomenclature, there's uh, kind of the angle theta, which I, you know, I apologize, kind of constantly changing our, our variables, but you just have to keep track of what it's measuring. In this nomenclature, the theta is the angle between the like, x-axis or east-west and sigma 1. And then beta would be the angle between sigma 1 and the failure plane. And so then xi is, is the kind of the angle between east-west or x and the failure plane itself that's optimally oriented. So there's just a couple different angles that are being tracked and you can use different ones. You could also measure relative to the, the normal to the plane as we have done and we will have to do in 3D. But you're basically just looking at that, again, the sigma and the tau. And they use the subscripts beta to show for the, the optimally oriented fault. So, you know, the optimally oriented fault could change its orientation as you move across the volume based on what the, the stresses are. But again, it's just in that case, we would be looking for, you know, assuming that the volume is full of faults. And so any one, you could find one that was optimally oriented and then it would slip. Does the um, kind of fault plane angle make any difference? You mean like the dip? Yeah. Yes, it, it, it does. So this is a 3D problem for sure. So 
uh, you know, this is kind of like one slice, a 2D slice across the, the sigma 1, sigma 3 plane. But, uh, and so a lot of times when we're teaching, we just do it in 2D because it's easier to draw. But it's for sure a 3D problem. And that's like, that's what's in this derivation is the 3D, you know, uh, stress tensor, which you can, you know, we kind of, when we derived the stress, we went from sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz, and the shear components, we said, well, there's an orientation you can find where the shear components go to zero, and then we just have sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. But in either case, it's fully 3D, and then inside that is some surface. So how do you go from the 3D stress tensor to the traction components on the plane? And you have to do, you have to account for the dip. So I'll try to show that in the next lecture, which I'll record and I'll show with some examples from South Mountain. So here's some more examples. So these guys got kind of famous for this. So this is this guy Toda. So he was, uh, he's a professor in Japan. His name is Shinji Toda. Um, and he was one of the guys who propelled this work. And so what they said was, well, look at this. We're going to calculate the uh, Coulomb stress that's imparted by one main shock earthquake on the er surrounding volume. And I think this was done for optimal orientation. So it's just looking for anything around there, see what happens, and, and what the stress change would be on it. So this little earthquake occurs, and this is in Southern California, near uh, north of Palm Springs. And so you can say, all right, well, could you just use the, the effect, the stress transfer basically from one earthquake to its surrounding volume to anticipate where the next earthquake will be. And so boom, then there was this one Joshua tree in 92. So this one's 86. So if you look at these two, you're like, well, looks to me like Joshua tree is in the blue. So it wasn't well anticipated by somehow by Palm Springs. But now we see J tr Joshua Tree event occurs and watch this. Boof! Landers occurred and if you look at the flamethrower coming out of uh, this Joshua Tree earthquake, right there to the northwest is where Landers occurred. So sometimes they, this is one example where the Joshua Tree is kind of thought of as a large foreshock of the Landers earthquake. And indeed, the, the, the initiation point for the Landers earthquake was in the south. Kind of, it was a unilateral rupture from south to north. And so, um, so that's kind of maybe was a success. But the other thing you can learn from these kind of calculations is the footprint. So basically, the s size of the effect scales with the size of the source. So a little earthquake has a little effect. Big one has a broader effect. And remember, this isn't shake or anything like that. This is the static or kind of permanent effect until something else happens due to that event. And so here, because it's kind of a more complicated source, so you know the, it's not a single fault plane, but it's, it's several fault planes. And they have different amounts of slip on them, which means they would have different uh, amounts of uh, stress that's induced in the volume, it gives us this more complex pattern. And so then, boom, if you look at that, you're like, huh, okay, so in that big red thing on the lower left was Big Bear. And so this was then the next one. They're like, see, you know, the Coulomb stress in Big Bear was high, and a couple days later, bam, the, the Big Bear earthquake occurred. So then they keep going. They're like, well, then seven years later, right in where it looks like there's a little bit of increased Coulomb failure stress to the northeast was the Hector Mine earthquake. And so, you know, again, this doesn't exactly deal with time except in sort of consecutive events. Um, and so these stress changes are permanent, but the seismicity is not because the permanent, the seismicity kind of, bless you, releases some of this induced stress. So that was something they were kind of, was pretty compelling. People were like, wow, that's pretty cool. And of course, everybody thought of things to criticize it. But 
it's pretty effective as like an initial way to uh, think about stress transfer. And this is just a 3D kind of 3D view, and it shows some of the the uh, aftershocks. And so these first three hours of aftershocks are kind of all right in the red. And then this big bear, so promotes the big bear earthquake. And then here is then seven years later, so this is just a 3D view of a uh, hector mine. And so we see, it's a little bit complicated, but the first seven years of aftershocks from landers is plotted in the little white dots. So they are more in the red than the blue. And so a lot of subsequent work was done to kind of address the uh, statistical correlation, but at least from our eye, it looks pretty good. And then hector mine's right in that spot of red. So that was kind of Mojave Desert examples or Mojave examples. Another one is, is from um, the San Francisco Bay Area relative to the 1906 earthquake. And so these were earthquakes from before 1906. So these would be known historically mostly based on felt reports, kind of reconstructing, well, where was it? And so we don't know them that well, except like the Hayward Fault, the East Bay, that was a pretty big earthquake, I think, 1868, and it was pretty well known. They called it the big, the Great San Francisco Earthquake until 1906. So, um, so these they're kind of all around these earthquakes. But then, after 1906, there was like nothing. So everyone's like, "Well, what happened?" Because the other problem is, since 1906, a lot more people live in the Bay Area, and then the idea was, well, that's because the Bay Area faults fell under the stress shadow. So if you calculate this is different people, but using the same approach, you calculate the Coulomb failure stress due to what we think happened in 1906. The whole Bay Area is in a shadow, which means it had the, C, the Coulomb failure stress decrease. And so then it's like, well, uh, you know, maybe that's why the earthquakes have been delayed. And so then people got nervous because in like 1989, we got uh, Loma Prieta earthquake occurred and that's kind of right below like where the R, the end of where the word rupture is, right south of that is where, where 1989 earthquake occurred. So we started getting a few more earthquakes in that period kind of 80, 100 years after 1906. So maybe we've started to recover and uh, erase the stress shadow and we're back to kind of maybe anticipating some earthquakes. It's like building up that stress again. Exactly. Because remember, we talked about a little bit with respect to the induced seismicity, but there's always a background tectonic stress. We know it's a plate boundary. So, you know, you you wipe out the stress. It's like you, you know, you burn the, the gas, but it's always getting more because of the long-term plate tectonics. And so it will ultimately go, it'll make the shadow go away. But this was some of their calculations, so they then started looking at Coulomb stress since 19, 1838. And so you can, this is another group that did this. USGS and then NIST, she works for a big uh, reinsurance company, so this is a kind of hazard-oriented uh, calculation. But you, what you can see is it's all blue along the San Andreas, which is what failed in 1906. So, uh, so even though it's since 1838, so they tried to go far enough earlier to kind of account for what they knew in those other earthquakes, and then go to you know 2004. So still, the the San Andreas in the Bay Area doesn't look like it wants. It, you know, it, it has a relatively decreased hazard based on a calculation like this, whereas out in East Bay we're starting to increase the stress, the Coulomb failure stress, so maybe it's a higher hazard. And so then they show like kind of right in those big red areas where these earthquakes that started happening, which were all relatively small, but were enough to stress people out. Um, so, so anyway, this has been very, it's been successful in some senses, but people are still always critical because they can always find an example where it didn't work. Um, and how to use it in a you know, operational sense to say, okay, we can use this every day to say what the hazard is, is still kind of an aspiration.
So a few more. This is a kind of a cross-sectional view. So this is a thrust fault that breaks the surface. So we can see that in general around the fault and to the surface it's uh, decreased coolant, coolant failure stress, but down dip along the continuation of that fault would be uh, a zone where you might expect uh, failure to be enhanced due to this increased CFS. And let me see, this was surface rupturing. This is one if it's blind, so it doesn't break the surface. And this would uh, maybe explain why they were trying to show these blind thrusts have a lot of distributed deformation above them, and that's because they might be inducing a lot of stress in that volume up dip. And so even if the rupture doesn't make it all the way to the surface, you might have a lot of distributed fracturing that's sort of driven by what's in the red area. Yeah, so then you can start to put like little guys in, and, they, and as they slip, they start to eat up some of that and do stress, but still, you know, takes a while to remove it. So they were working on this is because uh, in, you know, in the 80s were these blind thrust earthquakes. So these are cross sections and um, it got on everyone's mind because they didn't break the surface, but they were problematic. Like I was in the Whittier Narrows earthquake and it scared the crap out of us because I was in Whittier, so um, it was dramatic. So then, um, again, just looking at, uh, this is sort of the 3D, so this is a dipping thrust, That's what, but it's a map view of it, so that funny looking thing is the thrust kind of projection to the surface. And what they've done is, we know from observations of, of faulting in, you know, and also theoretical calculations that it's, it's not uniform slip, it kind of tends to have a peak of slip in the middle and tapers to zero on the edges, so they implemented this uh, tapered slip in their uh, toolkit so you could have it maybe more be more realistic because some critics were like well you're just putting you know uniform slip to the edge of your dislocation and so it's going to really enhance the stress off the tip because it's so abrupt but if you taper it maybe it's more realistic so they're like okay fine we did it and it still puts a lot of stress off the tips but it's slightly more consistent with observations and so this is, the, in this paper, they just are kind of exploring aspect ratios. So this is like a square fault patch that's dipping 30 degrees. But then, you know, they look at different length width ratios. And so then you can see short thrust is more efficient at transferring stress along strike. So, you know, I guess the point here is now this is a relatively long fault, this length width ratio of 6. And, you know, ba basically like we've been seeing, if you're off to the sides of the fault, in this case up dip, down dip, um, mostly you're, actually if you're on either side of it, I should say, you're sucking up a lot of that stress. But if you're up dip, down dip, or along strike is where you have the enhanced CFS. But what they're sort of showing is it's more efficient, I guess, just because it's small, but still has a pretty big effect, like these butterfly wings are relatively large. The longer fault has larger wings, but um, not that much larger compared to how much larger the fault is. But you know, the idea is that then, again, you would expect that faults that are either a long strike or up or down dip would be favored to fail based on the failure of this source fault. And so then they looked also at these receiver planes, so then they start kind of calculating, well, okay, given this idea of optimal planes, what, where are they, what are their orientations, and what type of faulting. So you can see here that the, off of the ends of this thrust fault, you anticipate more thrust faults, but in these intermediate zones, you kind of anticipate a little bit more of strike slip. So even your 3D permutation of what is the largest stress, either vertical or horizontal, can change, and so you, if you think Andersonian, you know, the vertical, what's the largest stress may not always be the vertical stress, it could be one of the horizontal ones, and so then that flips you to more of like a strike-slip state. So 
um, you know, they're just kind of continuing to exercise these tools to make these calculations and kind of use them, them to assess like there's usefulness, for example, for forecasting of earthquakes. So then the kind of one of the other great successes was, and this crazy phenomena, was this what happened in Turkey in the 20th century. So this is a map of northern Turkey. So just in the upper left is Istanbul. And there's a big fault that goes along called the, Nor the North Anatolian Fault. And it's pretty long. So if you look at the horizontal axis, it's like 1,100 kilometers. So it's big. It's a kind of almost as big as San Andreas almost the highest slip rate. But what's crazy is that the big pic big diagram in the middle which looks like some monsters or something, these different colored things, is actually the off or slip versus distance of different earthquakes that occurred along the North Anatolian Fault in the 20th century. So the best way to look at this is if you start at that big red one, 1939, it had big slip, like seven and a half meters. But then as you go to the left or the west, look at the dates of these earthquakes. So 1939, 1942, 1943, 51, okay, 44, but then 57, 67. So it's almost like a bunch of dominoes getting knocked over. And so this was always an example of like stress transfer that you, one fails, then the next goes, then the next goes. And so these guys in this paper simulated this and they also look further back in time. So this happened, this is the map view. The top is this historic set of earthquakes. So you can see, you know, 39, 42, 43, 44, 57, 67. So pretty systematic rupturing consecutively to the west. And then a few uh, little earthquakes, you know, to the right. The key issue is now what we know. So see this paper is written in 96, but if you remember, there were two big earthquakes in Turkey in 1999 that were quite devastating, and they were exactly, it was called the Izmit earthquake. It was right on trend with this set of earthquakes. But then we know this has happened, we think, to some degree in the past. It's harder to tell, you know, a little bit because it's still historic record. Turkey has a long historic record uh, for earthquakes written history, but you see there's some trends of systematic kind of directions of failure. It doesn't always work, but they show where these arrows are, like you see a few events, like at the very bottom, you know, 967, 1035, 1050. So this is, the 20th century is not the only time this apparently has happened, but these sequences of earthquakes. And it you can sort of anticipate it by using this Coulomb failure approach. So what they did was they built a model of the fault, and this is kind of a interesting more complex story, but if you look at the upper 3D block diagram, all the gray things are steadily slipping fault surfaces at depth. So that's like in the lower crust, the lower part of the lithosphere, it's the stably sliding part of the fault. Below, you know, we learned like 300 degree isotherms, so below 15 kilometers, or in this case 12 and a half. And then these little white rectangles are the little patches of locked faults. And so then the map at the bottom shows the increased Coulomb stress due to the deep slip. So that's like the plate tectonic stressing that would be happening behind the scenes. So that's just the engine for this whole thing. But then you can see the systematic effect superimposed on that, which is their forecasting of the Coulomb failure stress evolution due to the 20th century earthquake. So very top you see 1939, so they used what they know about the source, so they also included the amount of slip, so they get the correct kind of scaling. And so you see, you know, 1939 sucked up a lot of stress around it, but right along strike it induced increased uh, Coulomb stress, and then boom, get a little 1942 earthquake, 1943, we get the next big earthquake to occur in a zone where there appears to be somewhat increased Coulomb stress, but it was already maybe primed because of the, the tectonic stressing as well. So maybe the Coulomb stress just kind of just kind of blows on it, and that's all it needs to get it to go. But then you see 44, 57, 67, 
92, so they were kind of like in this paper almost raising a flag like this is a problem, which is next to Istanbul. And then in 99 was two big earthquakes and like 10,000 people died. So it had, you know, was a way to f potentially forecast, draw attention to what could happen. It, it was kind of fortunate in the sense that this historic set of earthquakes was kind of draw, drew their attention to the likelihood of, okay, well, a long strike route, that's the next location. Istanbul. Yeah. So then what they also showed, this was kind of a cool diagram, which is, you know, so the horizontal axis is time, and the upper plot is Coulomb stress at some point on the fall. And so the little cartoon on the right there shows kind of map view. So you have some amount of rupture on that red, that white fault. So it's like our source fault. And then a long strike at some point X, you're calculating the Coulomb stress. So, you know, what the diagram on the top shows is that the secular stress rate, that's just plate tectonics. That's just loading, loading, loading. It's going to get up to some failure stress, which is the gray line at the top. But the earthquake in the nearby area uh, causes a static increase in the sh Coulomb stress, which then, as time goes forward, can advance the time of the next earthquake. And so they kind of did a really nice job to sort of formalize this thinking in this paper. And then the earthquake rate, they tried to show that, you know, if you look at time versus, let's say, rates of earthquakes, you know, there's a background increase in rate due to the increase in the secular stressing rate. But then right after that main shock event, we get this big increase. And so there's a transient increase from time-dependent nucleation, which means basically aftershocks. But then the, the darker gray is this permanent increase uh, that happens due to the, um, the earthquake on the, on the fault nearby. And so uh, that permanent increase in background rate is one that you could also look for to test this model. Um, but for me, f the kind of upper diagram was kind of pretty compelling because it was a way to combine the stress transfer with the secular stressing and then our kind of concept of what it takes for the earthquake along the fault to occur is a, some combination of background stressing and changes in stress nearby. And so this is 96. So this kind of thinking has evolved significantly in the last you know, 25 years, but the concept, the basic framework was laid out here in a really nice way. Questions? Yes. Um, first, so can you explain the butterfly wings again? Yeah, so it's just uh, the butterfly wings is like what they talk about. Um, Butterfly wings is just like the description of this pattern of, so remember this is a map view, and we're looking at the, at the stress change at, eight, at a horizontal plane eight and a half kilometers deep. So it's kind of like if we look at, um, if you think of this block diagram that I can draw, So inside this block, and at about eight and a half kilometers, we take a plane, and on that plane, we're going to calculate um, the Coulomb thudder stress. But inside here also is a fault. And it's a little bit hard for me to draw, but it's sitting in here like that under the ground. And so when it slips, so it's a reverse fault, when it slips, then it induces these stresses around it. And so with that, so what we're seeing in this map view is the map view of what happens on that eight and a half kilometer deep plane, the calculation plane. And, you know, so it's kind of intersecting this little, little plane right there. But on either side, like out here on that plane, there's our, our kind of little butterfly wing there's another butterfly wing here. That's this place where the Coulomb stress is increased. And then out in front, so out over here on that plane, it's decreased. 
and also on this side it's decreased. On the like eight kilometer plane, not the fault plane. Right. Okay. So it's, it's a little bit kind of tricky to see, and I'm not sure I helped by trying it this mm -hmm. way. But you're looking at the map view of this eight. It's not the topographic surface. It's eight and a half kilometers deep because that's maybe where the next earthquake would initiate is at this seismogenic depth, and so the the butterfly wings are just a like a way to talk about that pattern but the meaning is it's a place where that Coulomb failure stress is increased and therefore uh, would um, suggest that and I, I, this I forgot if this is optimally oriented or other thrust fault planes but it doesn't matter that much it's just you know some faults would be uh, have this increased Coulomb stress along them and it might move them closer to failure kind of like we just saw for the North Anatolian fault case so it's just putting a little more stress on them nothing might happen but if they're close to failure then it's gonna may push them across that strength and then there'll be another event another event so does that help or what what were you kind of oh um, trying to figure out from it I guess I guess I thought it referred to how the strength of the ch or the magnitude of the stress change decreases, like following that shape. Or is, well, they're different? just like contours. Okay. So it's just the redder it is, the higher the value, and yeah. then as you go down, it decreases. So the main point to take away from this and the next one is that the shape of the source fault affects to some degree the extent of influence and but these in this particular slice you get these still these kind of butterfly wings of the pattern in that horizontal plane due to this slippage okay. and we can do let's see if and Both of those have you? yeah but let me see if, if I can remember we have our this Coulomb software. And I was playing around with this a little bit. So let's see. If you go in here. And this is made by the same guys. So this is like they a lot of what I've just showed you was calculated using some version of this software. Reason because we might be able to look at this in 3D, it might help. But let's just look a little bit here. And I've made this available to you guys, so if you want to play with it, you just have to you click on like open existing input file, and then you go look in input files and start with something simple like this one, this example 2 LL. So I happen to know that's a left lateral fault. So there's this, the, f the faults, like the source. And so what we can do is if we, under functions, we can calculate the stress. And so we can do Coulomb stress change. And then over here, so this is, again, where you say, okay, specified fault. So this would be, this is strike 41, dip 90, rake 0. So this is basically a long fault that have the same orientation as this one. And this has a depth at of seven and a half kilometers is our slice friction's 0.4 and uh, the color saturation is kind of how to visualize it but let's just look at this boom so we sort of saw this already this was this asymmetric one but you can do another calculation which is to um, I saw a cross section I had this working earlier with my demo. It showed, yeah. Ah. Let me see, where'd that window go? Ah, here it is. So if, I, if you do cross-section, so this would be 
you know, just let's look across this guy. So it may not be that interesting because that's a, a cross section across the middle of the strike slip fault. But we're going to go, it just gives the extent of this thing, calc and view. So this is the cross section of that. And so what you see, oh, okay, so this fault actually doesn't break to the surface. This is like a blind strike slip fault. And so in this cross section, we see you know, it has some other kind of wings, but you see that, again, when you're in your, you know, a long strike of it, if you go perpendicular to it, you're in that zone where it's consumed some of the stress in a way, or it's, it, the Coulomb stress that is, has induced will not advance slip on similarly oriented planes. But down dip, and up dip because it doesn't break the surface, it increases the stress. So if we just look a little bit, then we're like, okay, well, what's going on with this fault? Then if you go over here to functions, change parameters, all input parameters, um, you can look and first you can be like, okay, fault data, x start, y start, x finish, y finish, code just means it's like a strike slip fault. But then here, you so you see dip, and then it's 5 to 15 kilometers, so that's why we know it's blind. So you could change this. But what I want to show then, let's go then to go to your question, Jisoo, is I think if we go to find a... Uh, this one I think is a thrust, this example two, let's see. So, okay, slightly different orientation than our other example from the, the guys, but let's start just like, remember, let's do the displacements first. So let's look at what does this look like if you slip it. And there, so it's sort of a, it's a little bit hard to see, but basically our calculation depth again is at seven and a half kilometers. And so it's sort of an exaggerated view of what's happening to that surface. So it's like if there's a bedding plane exactly seven and a half kilometers deep, how much would it be displaced? So it's kind of exaggerated because it's it's not, you know, this Z is kind of confusing. Remember we had this conversation with with Joe the last time where this is depth in kilometers, but this is scaled in the same units of slip as on the fault surface. So the vertical here is probably in in meters, so this is like 10 meters of uplift and a few meters of downdrop. So that's this, and then again, if we go into the parameters, we can look at the input parameters, and we can see, okay, this guy does break the surface, bottoms of 15 kilometers. So now, let's see here, so ready for some butterflies? Mm -hmm. See if we can do it. So stress, Coulomb stress, and we'll do right now the same plane, basically all faults, same orientation. Calculation depth is seven and a half kilometers. Poof, let's see. Ready? Okay, the, so our resolution's kind of crappy, so the, it's a chunky uh, butterfly wing. So you can go to input parameters, and we change our, um, this increment. See, it's four kilometers now for the calculation grid. So it just, calculates every four. Let's do every one. And now redo it. Boom. So they're not as butterfly-y as before, which I don't know exactly why. Yeah, I guess that was really my question. Like, yeah. what is it a butterfly, and what is it more like blobby? Well, it could be that this is because this is remember this is par this on the same plane, whereas it could be that the butterflies are for optimal oriented. So that oh. means it's anything. So let's see if we can do optimal oriented. Yeah, on the same plane, wouldn't because along the fault is because it's a cross fault, so that's like here and here. I think there wouldn't be too much. In that area. Well, it, no, it's any fault disorientation. Right. So if the main one's here, it's anything here, 
here, here, here, here, here. It's anything the same orientation. On the fault plane. No, same fault yeah. plane yeah. orientation, but in the volume. Okay. So it's all faults of that orientation. So it's what it says is it faults that would be like near it and parallel on top or bottom would be in the blue, would not be likely to fail. But if oh, you go right. along okay. strike, this one, like if my left right. hand is the source fault, this receiver fault is in the red mm -hmm. and it would be likely to fail. Right. There's that red and orange area that's above the blue. Oh. Right, so those would be up dip. Because remember, this is a weird, this is the, um, horizontal planes is kind of a little bit of a strange perspective relative yeah. to the dipping fault that's cutting through it. But let's see if we can calculate, um, let's see if I, do I have my stress control panel. Can this cross section code handle like doing these blobs in three dimensions that we can like rotate around and see it? I think so. I, I Let's just look. But here you can see this is the this is the cross section along that AA prime. And so the what you want to appreciate is the map. I guess I can't quite do it. Um, the the map view that we're looking at is cutting is calculating along this plane right here. Mm -hmm. So that's why it looks strange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't quite move this guy. Oh here we go. So just if you look at those guys together. You know, this big red thing, you're cutting basically across that red right there. So that's why it looks a little weird. But um, let's try a couple things. So one is, uh, so I don't know if we can do 3D stress. Let's look. Not really. You, We, we could look, but I think this is hard to to visualize it because you'd have like, iso surfaces of stress. But let's try to do Coulomb stress change for optimal faults. Okay, so I think this is going to be hard work, so I'll start it now because it has to do a uh, like a grid search. It basically has to go through every possible orientation and calculate um, and look at the, you know, what's the optimal orientation in that sort of induced stress field and then calculate what's the the traction pairs on it. So it's it's actually working really hard right now because it's doing this grid search. But let's see if we get some butterfly wings out of this. So um, what I will say and, and I'll try to talk about this in the, in a video next is that for the igneous or the volcanologists here, um, you know, it has a mode where you can do dikes. And so one of the cool things would be to look like it, in a way the effect is the same. Like if you have a dike that opens off the front is the likelihood of more dike injection. As whereas we know that off on either side of it, f the dike injection is less likely. And so you can explore the same phenomena with, with the same, you can, ex I should say you can explore uh, intrusions with the same tool. And I'll show that a little bit in a moment, but I guess we have to finish this calculation. So many slides ago, there was a figure that had the butterfly wings or blobs, I don't remember which, but two differently oriented faults were there. So it didn't matter that the surface trend was different, it just mattered that the, they were in the same volume, so to speak, and one of them was the source fault well, that the other was the receiver. Well, what I thought you were asking is, is because this is static calculation, you can sum up the effects of individual source faults to get the cumulative effect on the volume because mm -hmm. there's no time. So the elastic properties are the, you just add them up in 3D. And so you can have very complex patterns due to the superposition of simple models. So that's like that Landers rupture, remember, it was kind of complicated pattern, so it was mm -hmm. just adding up a bunch of little rectangle effects. Okay. But um, more to your question, I don't remember, do you remember, yeah, let's well, I look. Think, I think it was actually, um, like was it no, in? but it was maybe the side or two before Landers. But I mean, same idea, where Landers, yeah. Like these guys. Segmented. 
I was just wondering how that all worked. Yeah, so this is just a single plane probably as the source fault and then the colors are the calculation on either optimally oriented faults or parallel faults. And then, you know, this is just marching forward. And so this, this one's all by itself. So this is not adding up the effect of North Palm Springs plus Joshua Tree. It's just, okay, this is Joshua Tree. And then what this set of slides is trying to show is that these successive earthquakes in general were in portions of the volume that had increased coulomb fair stress. So like, you know, Joshua Tree looks like it promoted the failure of Landers. And then Landers looks like it promoted the failure yeah. of Big Bear. Yeah, so this is just, you, they just took the, you know, they, they said, okay, well, in that big red blob on the lower left is where Big Bear ended up occurring. So then they took what was known from detailed work of mostly seismology, what the Big Bear earthquake, which is a weird, like, two-plane event, and they then put little rectangles in to represent those two planes and what the slippage was on those two planes, and then they calculated the Coulomb stress from the Big Bear event. And then they might have added it, and they might have added Big Bear plus Landers to help make the argument for um, Hector Mine, because it's kind of like you have to jump ahead, like here's Landers, then this happened just like six to 12 hours later, and then this is seven years later, but it was kind of in that maybe a little bit of red, and so then this illustration shows better where Hector Mine occurred. So let's just look and see if we're done here yet. I'm still searching. So this is a tough calculation, I guess, for our program. Other questions? For these calculations, would it help to have like the rock strengths plotted, kind of like a geologic map of rock strength? A really good question. It would, but it's rarely done. And it's in part because, um, oh sorry, let me, um, I'm actually looking at, at uh, let me get out of the presentation. It, in part, it's rarely done because it seems like it doesn't matter that much, as much as you'd think. Like the, the behavior of the crust at short time scales is kind of uniformly pretty elastic and only when you're in like shallow, like in these sedimentary basins, like really shallow, do you see some behavior differences. But in detail, we don't see a big effect from the rocks at short time scales. But, you know, I think that's the next generation kind of question to ask and to, and to explore. Because now we have better observations, so we might be able to be like, yeah, yeah, we're seeing that there actually is a small difference as you go from hard rock to soft rock. And then also, like, the seismology might show it better or the, you know, like geodesy, some uh, subtle variation. But especially at this time in the 90s, uh, the ability to observe didn't show much of a difference. And also to make that calculation is pretty, it, much harder. So it's easier to do when things are uniform. And oh, why is this not? Let me see here if I can just get control of my PowerPoint. Okay, good, I got that back. And then this guy is still calculating. So, other questions while well, I'm waiting? So this is like, if you do use this, and this could be interesting for you guys' projects, I, re I encourage you to do it, but don't be greedy in terms of like your grid resolution, like run it coarsely first and be like, okay, mm -hmm. it looks like it works, and then increase the, or decrease grid resolution because it spends a lot more time searching. But let me just look if I can launch a second MATLAB. Let's just look in here, because I wanted to show you guys. So these input files, you can adapt. And so I think like this, um, here's an example 8 dike. 
input. I guess my map, my computer doesn't recognize that it's. Let me see if I can get a, a second MATLAB open. Well, these are only. I think it's not going to let me open something else because it's running this calculation. Yeah, anyway, I guess I'll, I'll try to show it in a little video to save time for you guys. But, um, so yeah, any, any other questions while we're waiting here? So anyway, I guess the point for today was just to sort of exercise this, you know, one of the key things I think about when I'm work thinking about faults and dikes is, and this kind of structural geology is this, you know, it's really good to have a good intuition about the stress transfer. And so it's, you know, what are the, like, scales of influence, um, you know, what seems to drive failure, how does it seem to work? And so we saw that maybe it works for some series of earthquakes and, I think in some volcanic cases, people have used this to sort of predict directions of dike propagation. And you can, I think the other point to make is that the, even with simple sources, you can have pretty complex spatial variation that in like the Coulomb stress, which means you can have fairly complex response in the volume. So like in the case of dikes or faults, you might activate some in what initially might seem like strange places until you, you know, calculate the 3D Coulomb stress. You're like, oh yeah, it's right where I, where it should be, but you might not anticipate that to begin with. So, um, other question? Do you know what the kind of longest time scale between faults would be? Between when, like, earthquakes? Or? Yeah, like one triggers another, but it's like a thousand years later. Good question. Very good question. Um, because, and this was kind of what the, one of the bigger criticisms of this is there's no time. So we don't know when. So you could see like in that Lander's case, it was like 12 hours to Big Bear, but it was seven years to Hector Mine. There's no way to deal with that in the, this formulation. Um, so, yeah, it's like they claim victory when it works, but don't. it's just like, oh, it's complicated when it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. and And so... I think the the closer in time, the more compelling it is because the more time that passes, more other processes occur, like those stresses can be relaxed, the back other sources of stress can become important and overwhelm whatever remains from... Why are the stresses relaxed? Well, because the rocks, it's a good question, you know, but like the rocks, we think of like, we talk about Coulomb failure stress, so if you're above the failure line, it's slipping, and below it, it's stable. But actually, something they call sort of subcritical failure is just that if you, you know, the rock just can get fatigued, like it can just get weak. The longer you hold it under some stress over time, it will maybe f somehow fail, or the volume, like some pores will collapse. Mm -hmm. And so there's a time-dependent kind of relaxation. In the short term, everything's like can hold back the stress, but then over long term, the weakest links start to f to fail, like pores close, small faults slip, and then once they slip, they might induce small stresses around them that let other parts of the volume fail, and so we don't sustain these stresses for infinite time in realistic materials. Mm -hmm. And then, as I was showing for the example of the North Anatolian Fault, to kind of go back to your question, Aaron, is there's the background plate tectonic loading, which will sort of overwhelm any maybe uh, transient effect from an earthquake. So, you know, um, and then other thing is, is this is all kind of, you know, static time independent transfer in elastic crust, but, 
what people started working on also is time dependent, like viscous flow. So, you know, if you you slip in the upper crust, it induces a lot of stress in the lower crust, but that might induce flow. And so then the lower crust will flow and that will induce stresses and in back up into the upper crust. So what we saw was these time dependent um, post seismic signals that were uh, coming from deeper flow. So what I've always thought is like in in the like continental interiors, you might have a big earthquake, but it might take hundreds of years for that post seismic sort of lower crustal flow to transfer the signal, which it could be the stress signal, to other parts of the continental interior. So more complex processes, you get longer time for the interaction. How do you track that? Well, um, now it can be tracked with like GPS, so they mm -hmm. can see it for at you know over decadal that time scale. Flow. Yeah, you don't see the ductal flow. What you see is the effect of the Earth's surface. This okay. kind of broadening of deformation, okay. um, and it's consistent with low with kind of lower crustal flow. Mm -hmm. But um, otherwise, we we just kind of think it's there from like the development of fabrics that we see yeah. over geologic time.